And uh, Jeff Hendrickson said if Brother Oliver sang up front that he was going to join the choir the next week. So Jeff, we'll look forward to having you in the choir. And so, Jeff, that's not true. You can't join the <laughs> uh, For the protection of all the saints, Jeff will not be allowed in the choir. And so take your Bibles. Let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings in chapter number 15. All right. Uh, just so you know, when, when Johnny says amen tonight, that means the Eagles score. Uh, when Jamie says amen, that means the Chiefs have scored. And so if you'll keep, tr there you go. And so it's seven to nothing. We know that. And so uh, a hallelujah is a field goal, guys. So keep that in mind. I'm teasing. So if you look, God will judge you harshly. And uh, please, if they're looking on their phone during the service, just point them out. Just Yvette, just boy, oh boy, that was harsh. Good night, John. You're lucky that woman puts up with you. I'm telling you right now. To which John will say amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's let's first Kings chapter 15. First Kings chapter 15. Uh, let's jump right in tonight. First Kings 15. Let's stand together and we'll do that in reverence to the word of God. First Kings chapter 15 and verse number one. The Bible says, Now in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Absalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father's uh, father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Let's pray. God, I come to you tonight. Lord, I need your help. There's, there's, there's some things here, Father, you've put on my mind and on my heart. And Lord, I believe they're uh, for your people. And I pray that, Father, you guide my words and my thoughts. I pray that what I say tonight would be first and foremost glorifying to you, but also helpful to your people. Father, help us to grab hold of truth and help that truth to grab hold of us. I pray that it would transform us and make us the people that you'd have us to be. Father, please help us. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, keep your keep your Bibles open. We're we're going to look at a lot of Bible tonight, but I but I want I want to start out here tonight because we're we're going to see some things and we're going to be going to some New Testament passages and then we're going to be coming back to Second Kings. But the Bible talks about Abijam here Ab, 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 Abijah um, in his reign, and he was not he was not a a good man. The Bible says he walked in all the sins of his father which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord. His God, as the heart of David, his father. In verses 4 and 5, the Bible tells us that God was gracious with the nation of Judah because of David. David was the human benchmark for the kings of Judah. We're going to see that, all right, tonight. We're going to see that, that time and again, David will be brought up in the conversation. Now, by the way, um, the scriptures don't whitewash David's sin with Bathsheba and his terrible sin of uh, uh, murdering Uriah. But it does say that David served God and loved God and obeyed God with his life. It does tell us that David served God with a, with a pure heart or with a perfect heart. With that being said, I want you to take your Bibles and let's go to, let's go to Acts in chapter 13. There's a sister passage in 1 Samuel, but I want to see the one in Acts in chapter 13. Acts in chapter 13, and this is a sermon that Paul was preaching, and of course, thousands of years after David, and it says this, Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, it says, and when he had removed him, that Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. So, so God is giving this testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. In the book of Psalms in chapter 17, David refers to himself as the apple of God's eye. David was the human measuring stick for the kings of Judah. And folks, I think tonight as we step back and consider this, 
we need to understand that there are people that God puts into our lives, not comparing ourselves among ourselves, but people in our lives that we are to follow their example. And we are to glean and learn how to serve Christ from them. If you got your Bibles, I want to prove this to you. And I want you to go with me now to 1 Corinthians in chapter 4. 1 Corinthians in chapter 4. Generations after David was gone, you will see him being referred to time and time again with the kings of Judah. They will be measured up to David's example. Not the fact that he fell into sin, but that he loved the Lord his God with all his heart. 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, and verse 16, the Apostle Paul is writing the church here, and he says this in verse 16 of chapter 4, Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. You see that? Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. Now, go a few chapters later to chapter 11. Chapter 11, by the way, Paul will, will clarify this statement. 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, now verse number 1. He says this, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So in chapter 4 he says, be followers of me. Chapter 11, he says the same thing again, but he qualifies it a little bit. He says, as I follow Christ. Now take your Bibles with me to Philippians in chapter 3. By the way, there are several other passages that we can use with this tonight, but, but for, for sake of time, and I'll, I'll try to be respectful here of that. Philippians chapter 3, in verse 17, the Bible says this, Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. Now, do you see what that's saying? Paul's saying, guys, you follow me. By the way, he's also saying, follow those godly examples that, that the Lord's put into your life. So I want to start out tonight by saying, there ought to be some people that God's given us in our lives that are benchmarks. Now, they're not our gods. They're not who we worship. We follow them as they follow Christ. We understand that. Or we ought to understand that. We're not comparing ourselves. But what I'd like you to do, if you've got a pen, I'd like you to, I'd like you to pull it out. If you've got a piece of paper there, maybe you've got a bulletin from this morning or you've got something that you can write on, okay? I want you to just right now, I want you to write down the three best Christians you know. Now listen, all right? These are not people who talk the talk, but these are people who walk the walk. This is not someone who has an understanding of the Scriptures. This is someone who is obedient and follows the Scriptures. But I want you to write their names. Now, this is between you and Jesus. Yeah, okay? I just want you to write that down. I'd encourage you, and I'd do that. All right? Grab a pen. All right? Grab a pen and write them down. All right? Say, I, I know we don't do this in church. All right? We just kind of sit and listen to the pastor. He talks about it. I'm going to try to get you to think tonight. So there's some people that God's put in your life, and you know God put them into your life. They have been a wonderful example, a wonderful test. Now, I'm not talking about people you don't know. I'm not talking about people that you've read about or people you've heard of. I'm talking about people you know. I want you to write those three names down. You got them written down? How many of you did that? Good lands. You guys are terrible. Now, the rest of three quarters, do you need a pen? Oh, I don't do that. I don't. Come on now. All right. Write them down. Okay. Just jot them down. All right. By the way, I did this. I know who I've got written down. All right. By the way, they're between me and God. But God's put some people into my life that have been highly influential, that have been very helpful. And honestly, they are a benchmark for me. There's someone that I can step back and I consider this. Now, God bless you, Alyssa. Good, get that girl a hanky. Now, when you have that done, I want to give you some thoughts here, and then we're going to develop these thoughts. Number one, tonight, everybody follows somebody. Everybody follows somebody. Secondly, who you follow is your decision. I said, number one, everybody follows somebody. Say that with me. Everybody follows somebody. Number two, who you follow is your decision. Number three, their end will be your end. Their end, their result, their outcome will be your end. Your result, your outcome. 
Now, if you've got your Bibles, okay, and I ask you to keep them open, we're going to look at some scripture. I want you to take your Bibles now to 2 Kings in chapter number 12. I'm just, I'm picking up now, uh, by the way, this is after uh, Athaliah had tried to destroy the line of Christ, the line of Judah, the kings here, and uh, she'd been very effective at that, um, save for one little boy. And in 2 Kings in chapter 12, we're introduced by, to a young man named Joash. Joash was providentially saved, of course, by his aunt, and, and the Lord interceded, and, 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 but she destroyed all of the other seed. And so the, the, the line of Judah, all right, the, 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 the tribe of Judah, that line is being restored here, all right? And so we're going to see that. We're going to look at just five or six generations, and we could look at about nine or ten, but we're just going to look at five or six tonight again because of time. But, but again, follow with me. So 2 Kings chapter 12. Now, we started out in 1 Kings, and we talked about how that David was the benchmark. He was the human, human measuring stick that God used many, many times for the kings of Judah. First, 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 1. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash, or Joash, began to reign, and forty years reigned in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zabiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jeho Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. So we see Joash or Jehoash here. He did that which was right as long as Jehoiada the priest instructed him. By the way, when Jehoiada died, Jeho Joash went off the deep end and he went into sin, sadly. Now we're going to look at the next king. Let's go to chapter 14. Chapter 14. After Joash, we're going to be introduced to Amaziah. Chapter 14, verse 1. In the second year of Joash, son of Jeho Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. He was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like what, who? David, his father. He did according to all things as Joash, his father, did, Howbeit the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burn incense in the high places. Now let's go to chapter number 15. We're going to see uh, Azariah's son, or Amaziah's son, uh, Azariah or Uzziah, and we're going to see him here in chapter 15. In the 20 and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. 16 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 2 and 50 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still in the high, on the high places. Now let's go to chapter number 15, and we're going to see Uzziah's son, Jotham, chapter 15, in verse 32. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Romalia, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was, he, was he, when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. Now let's, let's look at uh, Ahaz, chapter 16. Chapter 16. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Romalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like who? David, his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Let's look at one more king and we'll stop there. Let's go to chapter number 18. Chapter number 18. Verse number 1. And we'll meet Ahaz's son. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to who? David, that David, his father, did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. 
For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses, and the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. Now, with all that being said, I want, I want to make some observations. Number one, again, everybody follows somebody. Do you see that in those scriptures? Everybody in this passage followed somebody. Who you follow is your decision. Their end will be your end. Number one tonight, you will choose to do right with a perfect heart. You have a choice tonight. Choice number one, you will choose to follow those who serve God with a perfect heart. Hezekiah was that man. He served God with a perfect heart. He did all that his father David, not, not as his father Ahaz, not as his grandfather, but as his predecessor David had done. He served God, listen tonight, with a perfect heart. He chose to follow that. The second choice you have is you will choose to follow those who do right with an imperfect heart. You will choose to do right or follow those who do right with an imperfect heart. Thirdly, you will follow those who choose to do evil. Those are your three choices. Now, as I step back and consider that, all right, we, we looked at, I believe, six kings. One of them did that which was right with his whole heart. We had one of them that simply chose to do evil. And we had four of them who did right with an imperfect heart. Joash did right as long as someone restrained him. That would have been his uncle, Jehoiada. Amaziah, Uzziah, and Jotham chose to do right, sort of. Kind of like the, <laughs> the generation before. And as I got to looking at this and considering it, this is, this is what the Lord was, was showing me. Folks, tonight... You and I are following somebody. By the way, I know some of you in here, and by the way, it's probably more young, the younger generation, but younger adults say, oh, I, I don't follow anybody. I do my own thing. Can, can I tell you, there are more people in that lane than anyone. Those people say, nobody tells me what to do. I do my own thing. That is, that is the fullest lane on the expressway of life, is it not? Adults, okay? I'm telling you, these, these young folks say, I'm my own boss. You know, you're not. You're, 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 you're an idiot, okay? You're, 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 you're in a lane that's so full, all right? I'm telling you right now, all right, everybody follows somebody. Everybody follows somebody. You can't get away from that, all right? You say, well, I'll do my own thing. Friend, you're, you're going to follow somebody. You're going you're gonna to be like Ahaz who followed the wicked kings of Israel, all right? They, he followed that the, his in-laws that were godless and wicked and went down that path. You may be like someone who serves God with an imperfect heart. You might, you might be uh, uh, like Joash. And, and, and boy, as long as you have supervision, as long as you have somebody over you, as long as you have accountability, as long as the circumstances around you are right, you'll blend in with your surroundings and, and you'll play that role. But as soon as that's gone, well, that imperfect heart shows up. Maybe you're somebody who just kind of does what's in front of you. You never think about it. You just kind of do, oh, that's what my father did. That's what my grandfather did. That's what my friends do. That's what my cousins do. That's what my coworkers do. That's just what I do. But I want to show you what, what happened with these three groups. In all of these men's lives, in all of those passages I read you in 2 Kings, they have one thing in common. They talk about the high places. Well, what are the high places? The high places were worldly places of worship. They were artificially lifted up places. By the way, some people worshipped God there. It's in the scriptures. They worshipped God at the high places. But God did not like the high places. They were a heathen practice. They were worldly. They were not of the Lord. God always told His people, you build an altar. He wanted a plain altar. You, you know the story. Time and time again, He just tell them, get a heap of rocks and, and you put my sacrifice up. God didn't, he, he doesn't like that ornate stuff. He doesn't, he, he wants something simple and He wants something true and He wants something real. He wants something genuine. God, 
God's not after the outward trappings that we try to manifest. And, and show, boy, I've walked into some churches, and you can see the money, and it's literally on the walls. I mean, they, they are beautiful, and they are in it. And I'm telling you, they're, they're full of dead men's bones. They're whited sepulchers, all right? There's nothing there. There's, there's no presence of God. There's no spirit of God there. I've been to some of the, those buildings when they have funerals or uh, when they have uh, some occasion going on, and I'll tell you, they're dead. They're cold places, all right? You, you, almost, you almost feel scared or uh, intimidated to be there. There's, there's something wrong. Well, these high places were worldly places of worship. And as I got to thinking on this, I thought, here's, here's what happens. All the kings who did evil, and by the way, if you go the next three or four generations, you'll find this. All the kings who did evil used or built the high places. The kings who served God with an imperfect heart and by the way, the great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. You're not supposed to serve God with some of your heart. You're supposed to serve God with all of your heart. But these men that serve God with part of their heart, hey, they, they did some good things. They did right in the eyes of God like their father had done, but not like David. They didn't, didn't serve God with a, with a perfect heart. They didn't serve God with a, a pure heart. They, they didn't serve God with all that they had. You say, well, well Pastor David fell. Friend, that, that's the problem. We, we downgrade David because he sinned. But you know what David has in common with every one of us? We sin too. And God said, I found a man after my own heart. This is a man who desires me and loves me above all. Even when he fails, he will get up and he will pursue me again, which is the testimony and the greatness of David. But these kings, the four of them, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, and Jotham, they left the high places alone. Then you have one man named Hezekiah. And when Hezekiah came to power, he destroyed and eliminated the high places. And here's what the Lord impressed upon my heart. You see, these high places, as I said, are worldly places of worship. And friend, here's what happened. They're gray areas in my life. Can I worship God in the high place? Yes. Yes. Kings did. The kings of Judah would, would go into the high places, all right? Solomon would go, and he would worship God in the high places. You go down through the scriptures and you'll find man after man, not, not all of them, not every one of them, but many times worship of Jehovah God would happen in the high place. It was a place where you could serve God. But truth be told, the vast majority of the time, it was a place where false gods were served. It was one of those places that quite honestly kind of made it hard to discern. Is that a place of good or is that a place of evil? Well, in Christianity today, I'm not going to say that we have high places, literally. But I will say that we have plenty of high places, spiritually. We have high places such as our music. We have high places such as our podcasts or our phones. We have high places such as our personal philosophies. High places such as dress standards and how we present ourselves. We have high places such as worship styles. And friend, I'm going to tell you something right now. Satan will get you in the gray areas. Because what happens is we allow these areas into our lives. And friend, I'm going to tell you right now, you are not ser called to serve God with a part, partial heart. You're called to serve God with your whole heart. And so tonight, as you sit wherever you're seated at, in the Holy Spirit of God, by the way, He knows exactly what part of your heart is not serving Him completely. And you say, well, well I, I'm serving God like, like my, my grandpa is. I'm serving God like my dad is. Hey, I want you to find the best Christian you know. The best Christian you know and say, that's my benchmark. Hey, that person, I know them. I know them. they are sold out for God. They've given everything to the Lord. That is what you are to pursue. And when you reach that benchmark, you follow Christ. But I'm going to tell you right now, the truth be told, many of us in this room, we could honestly say, hey, I might serve God like, like brother so-and-so, but I do not serve God like that man. 
There's a man that God put in my life years ago. There's a man God put in my life in the last few years or the last few years. And that man loves God with all of his heart. And I've never seen somebody so sold out, separated, willing to give up whatever he has to give up to serve God. Hey, I'm telling you tonight, you don't want to be around that guy. You'll find your crowd. You'll settle in and you'll settle down where you fit. And would to God tonight, some of us would say, I'm not going to serve God like, like, like so-and-so did. I'm going to serve God like that benchmark, that, that human measuring stick. That man, that man gave everything to serve God. That's why we ought to read biographies of great Christians. These are men and women who gave their lives to serve God. And we read them and say, well, well I'm so glad they did, but I could never. And that's where you're wrong. Every one of us ought to say that person. That person that I know. That person that influenced my life. That person that did so much. I ought to do everything I can to hit that mark. But we'll say, well, you know, I'm like sister so-and-so, and and she doesn't think that modesty is important, so I don't either. Well, I, you know, I'm like brother so-and-so, and he doesn't think that whatever music you listen to is important. That's our problem. We don't find, see, God said, I got a human measuring stick for you, boys and girls. His name's David. And Judah, every one of your kings, I'm going to judge him by that measuring stick. Because that's a man, in 1 Kings 15, he served me with a perfect heart. He pursued after me. He chased after me. In this one matter, he failed. But in everything else, he pursued me like nobody else. And sadly, of many of the kings of Judah, it said that they did not serve God like their father, David. And as I step back tonight, I wonder in your life, if that little list that I had you write down, do you love the Lord like they do? Do you pursue God like they do? Do you want God like they do? Are you sold out to God like they are? You say, well, well Pastor, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm hyper spiritual. I shouldn't compare myself to anyone. No, no, friend, that's not what the Bible's teaching. He's, he's teaching you not to settle. Now, that, that, that's, we always look for the lowest common denominator. We're supposed to look for the highest one. And we're, hey, Paul was given as an example to the Philippian church and the Corinthian church. And he said, follow me. He said, I am an example. Was he perfect? No. Did he have sin? Yes. But he said, you follow me as I follow Christ. But he said, follow me. I'm a living example of what Christianity ought to be. And would to God today, you and I would find some living examples of born-again Christians who love God with everything, who are willing to give everything to serve their God and say that. That is what I'll strive to do, to, to do today. Uh, moms and dads, I'm going to tell you right now, don't you raise your kids like, 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 hey, you say, well, you know, they're in church and they've been around church a long time and, and their kids, are, you know, they're doing okay. They don't hate God. No, no, no. You find a, a mom and a dad who've raised their kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord who love God and are sold out for God and whose kids are serving God and you model the way you raise kids after that. I'm so tired of us settling for the low. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to discipline my kids because, you know, so-and-so doesn't discipline their kids, and their kids aren't that bad. Is that your goal? I mean, it, it, to settle? Man, I don't want that. I'm going to shoot for the highest human mark that God's given me in my life. God's put some people in my life. Hey, that's why he, the moment I got saved, he didn't just shoot me off to heaven. He wanted me to grow. And then he wanted to be an example for somebody else who got saved so they could see how to do it right. Hey, uh, parents, don't let your kids hang around with the lowest, you know, the kids that, that don't love Jesus and aren't interested in things that God have a bad spirit. No, no, you say, son, you're going to hang around with that crowd. And uh, your daughter, you're going to hang around with that crowd. And parents, you should be a good example by doing that yourself. And we should shoot for the highest mark. I know some of this doesn't sit well tonight because we don't like this, but folks, this is the reality of it. We've gotten away from this in Christianity. And, it, well, you can't be my judge. Brother, you better find the best Christian you can and say, I'm going to do everything like them until I find somebody better. And when I find somebody better and God puts somebody better in my life, I'm going to model, hey, I learned a lot of things that I, that I do today from the great men who came before me. I have nothing original of myself. Any idiot tonight that thinks, well, I'm an original, you're, you're, you're a fool, man. You are made up of the people that you followed. You are made up. Hey, these young people today, they're not getting these wicked ideas on their own. They're getting them off of these stinking phones and off these dumb tablets, and they're watching these idiots on YouTube, and they're following them like a dog returning to their vomit. Just like, oh, they, they think it's cool. They're a fool. But everybody follows somebody. You better understand that tonight. 
You better learn that now. Adult, you follow somebody. Who you are today, if you'd be honest, is because somebody or somebody's influenced you. You didn't come to this place in your life all on your own because you're that intelligent. It was only by the grace of God. As I looked at this and thought about it, I thought, here's the problem. Too many of us. Six kings. One of them did evil, and of course we would never want to be that person. We know that. One of them did right with a perfect heart, and that's the one we ought to strive to be. But four out of the six, they left just they, they left those big old gray areas in their life. That's not that big a deal. It's just a high place. The people like them. It's really not that important. I mean, I... I I don't think we should be that extreme, right? I mean, come on. It's, it's just the way we dress. The way we dress doesn't really reflect anything. The music I listen to, it doesn't matter. Hey, my worship style, how we have church, it's not a big deal. Hold on a second here. You are creating gray areas. Well, how I discipline my kids isn't, isn't important. Hmm. And the high places stay. And here's truth be told. Can you worship God at the high place? Yes. Yes, you can. The problem is, the next person that comes along doesn't worship Jehovah God there. They worship a false god. And you left that high place. Well, pastor, I, I, it was just, as I was studying this and reading it, every single one of them, it talked about their heart, and then it talked about the high place. And I wonder tonight, in your heart, what high place is still existing? In your life, what high place is still standing? Folks, I believe in radical Christianity. I believe that when we get saved, we are transformed by the power of God. And I believe that our lives ought to reflect that. Everybody follows somebody. Who you follow is your choice. But I want you to know something. Their end will be your end. And before you get this... I can do whatever I want. I can follow whoever. You're right. You're right. God gave you free will. Every one of those kings had the ability to do whatever they wanted, and he let them. But you might want to find out where their lives ended up. You might want to find out where their families ended up. You might want to find out what their influence was. Because, Christian, I'll tell you tonight, some of us are we're headed for some, some rough endings. The Apostle Paul wrote Titus, and he told him, he said, you show yourself a pattern of good works. He wrote Timothy, and he said, Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, and my purpose. Christian, you find someone tonight, and you say, that's the best Christian I know. I'm going to follow their example. That's the best couple I know. I'm going to follow their example. Those are the best parents I know. I'm going to follow their example. Too many of us tonight are following the wrong examples. And would to God tonight, we'd say, no, that's who I want to be like. That's, who, that's whose marriage I want to follow. That's the kind of kids I want to have someday. And you follow the example that's been put before you. As a nine-year-old boy, I was given a letter by my father. And in that letter, as he closed it, he's writing as a dad to his son. But he said, son, pick out some good people and use them as your heroes. And he names a couple of people, and I won't bring them up. And he gives a couple other pieces of advice. Stay faithful, and read your Bible, and pray. But friend, we've run away from heroes today. We've run away from examples. We've run away from those good 
testimonies. And we've hyper-spiritualized it. Well, I shouldn't follow anybody. That's not what the scriptures teach. It's not. Folks, why do you think Jesus walked and talked on this earth with 12 men for three years? To be a good example. He said, you and go teach other men to do likewise. Right? Did he not? That's the Great Commission. The sad thing is, is Christianity has run away from that. And friend, let me just close with this. Everybody follows somebody. Who you follow is your decision. But your end will be their end. God is no respecter of persons. Let's go and stand to our feet. Folks, I, I wish I wish I could do this truth um, the benefit that it deserves. I would beg you tonight to write down three people. I know many of you didn't because we don't do that in church, but I'd beg you tonight, you write down three people. By the way, they don't have to be the same as your wife writes down or that you can, you write down three people and say that they're their character, their Christianity is what I want. Are they perfect? No. No, they're not. Did David disappoint some people when he sinned? Yeah, absolutely. But friend, I want you to know something. God's the one who chose to use David as the benchmark for years and years and years and years and years, for generations. Why? Because he said there is a human benchmark. There's a human measuring stick. There is somebody that loved God. Folks, I look back in my life and, my, and the greatest Christians that I knew, man, I, my, my father and Pastor Bodie, and I look back at those men. I look at men like Vernon Vanetta. I look at Jim Faulkner. I hate to say his name, but these men loved God. Loved God, Jim. But they've been tested. Have they been perfect? Where is Jim? Hiding? Yeah, she's sitting down. He's not perfect. But folks, listen to me. And I, I, I'm joking. I'm giving Brother Jim... But I chose some men as a young man to follow. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are still some men as a grown man that I follow. There's some people that my wife would try to model our marriage after, tried to model how we raised kids. We, we found people who did it well and did it right. Not perfect. But said so we're going to copy that. Because everybody follows somebody. Let me reiterate, if you say, well, I'm doing my own thing, you are, in the, you are in the lane that has the most people. There's so many idiots out there, I'm doing my own thing, I don't follow nobody. <laughs> Please, come to me after the service. I'll introduce you to a lot of people who are saying that same stupid thing, and you guys can all follow nobody going down the same path. Everybody follows somebody. But who you follow is your decision. Folks, the mannerisms you have tonight, the way you conduct yourselves, the way you speak. Paul said, Timothy, you've fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose. You know that. Timothy copied that by and large. But I want you to know that whoever you choose to follow, their end will be your end. So choose wisely. Choose wisely who you follow. I know some of you will be very hyper-spiritual. Right? You say, well, I follow no one but Christ. But truth be told, folks, listen to me. Jesus doesn't walk here anymore. He's put examples for you to follow. And yes, you follow them only as they follow Christ. I would never say differently. But I would beg you to consider this. Because in the, the high places, the gray areas, Satan destroys the imperfect hearts. As the instruments begin to play tonight, folks, I'd really encourage you, if God touched your heart, I'd encourage you to come to an altar and you take it up with the Lord himself.
Folks, there's so many things in, in this thought process, you know, but I, I, children are not always the, the best obeyers, but they are the best imitators. That transfers to adulthood. We are all following someone. We are. I don't care how independent you think you are. You're following someone. You justify everything. Everything stupid you do, you justify it. I've worked with kids for 25 years. Why'd you do it? So and so did. Oh, oh, and then your mother, right? What did your mom say? If everybody jumped off the bridge, would you? Truth be told, yeah. <laughs> The problem is it continues into the adult years. These kings tonight proved it. Well, Christian, tonight, who are you following? Those names that I asked you to write down, are you following their example? Or are you following someone else's? Have you, have you found the lowest among us? Or have you tried to find those who are doing it the best? Not perfect but doing it the best. And friend, tonight, I'd beg you, consider the scriptures, consider what I spoke on tonight. I think it'll be a help if you'll grab hold of it. I think it'd be good for us. Hey, there are some people that I look up to. Are they gods? No. They're good men, and I love them dearly. And I'm following their example. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm not. It's true. But friend, I want my end to be their end. That's why I'm following them. And would to God tonight we grab hold of it. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. And Brother Johnny and Brother Jamie didn't say anything, so I think the score is still seven to nothing. So it'll be all right. Brother George, would you dismiss us with